Hey, listen, better late than never. They they said I forgot about the fat electrician in the comments. I didn't. Okay, listen, I just been busy. We back the green screen holler. All right. A lot of people be like, Holly, you talk too much during the video. Shut up. I even made myself littler. I take up less of the screen. Listen, I'm going to pause when this is important, man. Listen, make sure y'all like, comment, subscribe. Let's get this. Indestructible Marine earns Medal of Honor. At 17, I thought you got to be 18 to go to the military. Hold on now. I'm going to be honest with you. I don't know if this is the luckiest man of all time or the unluckiest man of all time, but one thing's for sure. He just might be the toughest. Mm. Today we're talking about America's indestructible Marine Jack Lucas. He served three years in the United States Marine Corps, six months of which was inside of a prison cell. Mm. He stormed the beach at Iwo Jima. He survived jumping on top of two live grenades. He earned the Medal of Honor and he did all of it before his first day of high school, which is really just the beginning of the story. But before we get to all that, let's get before this for his first out of day the of high this school. This video brought you by Sundays, food for dogs. It's fancy food. For dogs. for dogs. Okay, look, long story short, there was a veterinarian that was mad that all the fancy, expensive dog food also needed to be stored inside the refrigerator, which is mm, lame because the refrigerator true. is for people food. So they went, they created the company Sunday's Food for Dogs, and it's high quality food that's been air dried. Essentially, it's jerky for dogs. So it's high quality and it doesn't need to be kept in jerky your fridge. Jerky, I mean, look at it. It even looks like jerky. Okay. Jerky is low key made. We have to be honest, bro. If you're a beef jerky eater, Point me to the good beef jerky. Maybe I ain't found it. Hey, to give you an idea of how healthy this food is, I'm going to go ahead and read the ingredients right off the bag for you. We've Hot got Cheetos. Meal, ferrous sulfate, niacin, thiamine monotrate, riboflavin, vegetable oil. Wait, no. That's the shit I put in my body. Uh, the dog food ingredients are as follows. We've got turkey, turkey heart, turkey liver, egg yolk, millet, pumpkin, kale, ground bone, fish oil, salt, parsley. You get the idea, it's really healthy. Which is a good thing because my dog's a pretty picky eater, okay? He likes the finer things in life, like fancy dog food, eating snakes in my backyard, licking his own ass, okay? He's got a very refined palate. It's super important that I get him good food, but not so important that I'm willing to put it inside of my fridge and that's where Sundays comes in. And the best part is they deliver it right to your door. So if you want to check them out i'm gonna have a link and a discount code down below let's get back to the video all right before we start this video i was just say look i'll be doing ships sometimes you know what i'm saying i'll be grocery shopping for people and how particular they be with a pet food yo i need the salmon with the beef mix or my cat not gonna eat it okay listen Ain't nobody freeloading in my house being that picky with food that's all i'm saying ain't too young let's get it all right, Jacqueline Harold Lucas, born on February 14th, 1928 in Plymouth, North Carolina. It is the mm. same exact story I've told time and time again. These guys all had the same childhood. He grew up during the Great Depression. He really liked boxing. He got in a ton of trouble and got in a lot of fights. When he was eight years old, his uncle gifted him a Marine Corps dress uniform hat, and he absolutely loved it. He wore the thing to school every day for months, and from that moment on, he always wanted to be a Marine. Mm. Fast forward to when he was 11, his dad would pass away from cancer, and Jack, understanding Understandably so, didn't take it that well and started getting in even more trouble and more fights. By the time he was 13, his mother, who was still in her mid-30s, was trying to find a new husband. And every time she would bring a guy home, the young 13-year-old Jack, who was up. a pretty big kid for his age and pretty skilled at boxing, would threaten to beat the shit out of him. I'm 10 years old, but I'll beat your ass. That, combined with all <laughs> the other trouble and fights that he was already getting into, his mother had no choice but to send him off to military school. It is there at the Edwards Military Institute that Jack and all the other cadets would gather around the radio to hear the news broadcast that the Japanese had attacked Pearl Harbor. Mm. Jack described this moment as the end of his childhood and from this moment on it became his sole ambition in life to go fight the japanese to he was 13 the only problem is, is he's 13 and you got to be 17 to join the united states marine corps so he did the only thing he could do he finished out classes graduated the eighth grade and went back home for summer he gets home mom doesn't just have a new boyfriend mom has a new husband it is a used car salesman and alcoholic by the name of radford jones oh alcoholic you know he was out here giving the mom the the left hook combos, boy. And it is very clear to the young Jack Lucas that this man has married his mother for the insurance money that they got from his father passing, and he is already doing his damnedest to burn his way through it. So obviously Jack is not a big fan of this guy and threatens to beat the shit out of him multiple times, which is actually a threat that carries some weight because now at 14, he is 5'8", 180 pounds and pretty good at boxing. Sheesh. So obviously the home life situation is pretty tense. The one redeeming quality nah, of Bradford crazy. Jones is that he had two sons that he brought into the marriage. So Jack now had two stepbrothers. And over the course of that summer, he truly came to think of them as his brothers. And then the oldest brother, Billy, would go off and join the Navy. 
By this point in time, Summer's coming to an end. He's getting ready to go back to military school, and he dreads the idea. He doesn't want to go to military school. He wants to go to the military. He wants to be a Marine, and he wants to fight the Japanese to avenge Pearl Harbor. So he decides that's exactly what he's going to do. He goes to the Marine Corps recruiter, lies, says he's 17 years old, gets the parental permission slip to take back home to have his mom sign it. Mom obviously refuses to sign it. He needs to go back to school, not go fight in World War II. So he forged the signature. Too. So Jack promises his mom, hey, give me your blessing to go do this, and I promise you as soon as I get back, I'll finish school. At which point his mom is like, okay, fine, you have my blessing, but I'm not going to lie for you. This permission slip says you need to be 17 years old, and you're 14. If you wait till you're 17, I will sign and give you my blessing to go off to war. No, what are you We ain't got time for? for all that. Do it. Yes, you can. For Jack, this wasn't good enough, so he forges her signature right in front of her and then tells stepdad Radford Jones to hop in the car and give him a ride to the recruiter's office. They get there, Jack goes in, Yo. hands over the parental consent form to the Marine Corps recruiter, and the Marine Corps recruiter's like, great, where's your birth certificate? And Jack is like, huh, what? And the Marine Corps recruiter is like, yeah, we need your birth certificate too. Okay, important context here. There was a ton of people that lied about their age and got into the military way before mm. they should have in the army and the Navy. But for some reason, the Marine Corps during World War II demanded birth certificates and verified your age to a degree that most other branches simply didn't. I have read multiple accounts of this and I have even personally been told by a World War II Marine that was at Mount Sarabachi when they raised the flag at Iwo Jima that if you wanted to be a Marine, you had to be 17. He's working to do for you, young man. I said, I want to sign up. He said, how old are you? I said, 16. He says, I can't take you. You got to be 17. He said, when you get to be 17, come back and see me and we can do business. So he could just walk right next That's door crazy. and try to join the army or the navy and probably get away with it. But he said, he's nope. always wanted to be a marine since he was eight years old. So he walks back out to the car. Radford's still sitting in it, head hanging low. He's absolutely devastated. At which point, Radford Jones, fucking stepdad of the year, is like, what? I thought I got rid of you. Why are you back? Jack tells him it's not going to work because he has to have his birth certificate to mm. prove that he's 17 years old. Otherwise, the Marine Corps isn't going to take him. Stepdad was trying to get home, get that liquor, and beat them cheeks. That's what he was trying to do. So Radford Jones marches right back into the recruiter's office and goes full car salesman mode. Walks right up to the Marine recruiter and is like, hey, I'm his stepdad. The kid's definitely 17. His mom actually lost his birth certificate in a house fire. Actually, now that I think of it, I don't even think he ever had a birth certificate, you know, because it's the early 1940s and all all kinds of people were still born at home the government doesn't even know that this kid still exists okay don't believe me we could cut one of his arms off right now and count the rings i guarantee you there's 17 <laughs> of them i think you ought to buy it today right now you want to know why because this buick is you the color is you look at it this is your car at this point the recruiter's like i mean all right fine whatever hands jack a clipboard with a piece of paper fill this out sign your name at the bottom jack does it signs his name turns around to you know begrudgingly thank stepdad for helping him out stepdad's already gone car's not even in the parking That's lot dude crazy. cool that doesn't matter he got what he wanted he is officially enlisted at the age of 14 on august 6th 1942 but he was out of here. He immediately gets sent off to basic training and he absolutely crushes it, gets put in a leadership role pretty much the entire time because he's the only one there with military experience because he spent the last year at a military academy. So he already knew most of the jargon, the ranks, how to march and so on. So he was one of the most high speed privates there. Besides that, nothing of note really happens while he's at basic training, except he did say he learned one very important lesson. One day, one of the drill instructors while they were out at the firing line said, who wants to drive a truck? Truck. And Jack, being a 14-year-old who didn't have much driving experience, was actually kind of excited to drive a truck, so he raised he his hand it. and volunteered. At which point, the drill instructor gave him an empty wheelbarrow, told him to go over there, fill it up full of ammunition, and haul ammunition up and down the firing line all day long. It is at this point that he learned to never volunteer for anything in the military ever again. After graduating basic training, he gets sent to Jacksonville Naval Air Base, where he basically gets to be a gate guard Burn. and do some more training. Now, he's outside of basic training. This is more advanced training. And when you go to these more advanced training courses, typically you're allowed to have liberty. Leave over the weekend. You're allowed to go out into town and drink and mingle with the civilians. I'm going to say that again, but slower. The 14-year-old Marine that nobody realizes is 14, including all the other Marines, the bartenders, and smacked. all the women at the bar. Oh! The women was giving the young 14-year-old the cheeks? 
Listen, America, we got we got to talk about something. Hold on. Is going to go drinking at the bar with the Marines every weekend. I'll let your imagination tell you what happens. No, man. I love you. So he finishes up training in Jacksonville. By June of 1943, he is sent back to North Carolina to Camp Geiger, where he's going to have a bunch of machine gun training, and he is absolutely excellent at running that machine gun. He does such a good job, in fact, that after finishing the machine gun training, he is one of nine Marines selected to stay at Camp Geiger and become an instructor. Kate, to most people, that's a good thing. But Jack is absolutely furious because he doesn't want to be a machine gun trainer in North Carolina. He wants to go to the Pacific Theater and fight the Japanese. Now, he finds out that he's going to be a machine gun trainer via letter, right? He is given orders on paper. He doesn't share those orders with anybody. All the other Marines were given orders at roughly the same time of what unit they're getting shipped out to and what unit they're going to be a part of. So Jack just doesn't tell anybody anything and he waits when the time comes that all the other marines are loading up onto a train to go all the way from north carolina to california on their way to the pacific theater jack says fuck it and he jumps on the train too he figures it's better to ask forgiveness and permission mm. what's the worst that could happen they ship him back and he has to be a machine gun trainer anyways he spends 30 days in the brig whatever best case scenario he gets attached to a different unit and he gets to go into combat so he's on the train for a couple of days they make it to california everybody gets days. off the train they form up there's an nco there with a clipboard and he reads off all the names on the roster after he finishes reading all the names on the roster he says is there anybody that i didn't call jack raises his hand and ceo's like why aren't you on the roster to which jack geniusly plays the stupid private role and just goes i don't know i was just told you get on the train keeping track of everything was the army's job i'm, I'm just here to which the sergeant is like Okay. That's exactly correct and is totally something that would happen. Okay. Um, you come with me. They go to the commanding officer's office. They walk in. The lieutenant is like, what do you want? The sergeant is like, this private's not on the roster. To which the lieutenant goes, so put Adam's it on the roster. Okay, now. boom. Mission successful. Jack may be the only person ever to go AWOL so that he could go to war. So they notify Camp Geiger back in North Carolina that Jack Lucas is here now and we're not sending him back. So now he is at Camp Elliott in California. And Camp Elliott is, I mean, they're training, but it's basically just they're there for a couple of months or a couple of weeks while they're getting moved closer and closer to the Pacific Theater to go into combat. So during the day they're doing stuff, you know, they're like moving supplies, administrative bullshit, but every night they're going out, they're getting hammered, going out on the town. This might be their last chance some of them ever have to have a good time. So that's exactly what they're doing and jack you gotta remember he's still 14 he's feeling kind of self-conscious he's got a bunch of other 17 18 19 20 plus year old marines talking and bragging about all the women they're sleeping with and how much they're drinking and all the crazy stuff they've done so in a desperate attempt to look cool he reaches into his bag and he pulls out his 38 caliber revolver actually his mom's 38 caliber revolver that he took with him and he's just sitting on his bunk twirling it on his finger it was fucking loaded and he fires off around through a couple of tents luckily he is cooked bro listen 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 if that boy would have hit somebody oh my goodness this story would have went so much more different but he did it so let's get back to it nobody was hurt but jack is like all right well time to mail that back home so he mails that back home to his mom shut up what the fuck are you doing man where did you get that shit my so be cool with a gun mission failed completely what else can we do to look cool i know what does any military service member Get regardless of branch do immediately upon graduating training they go out and they get a tattoo okay oh. sidebar yes i realize that i'm covered in tattoos and there's like five guns on the couch behind me and i'm basically making fun of myself at this point okay i get it anyways the real question here is what is this young 14 year old marine gonna get for his very first and probably his only tattoo well obviously we're gonna go with the marine corps globe and anchor right it's iconic every marine's Negative. got a tattoo of it that's what we're getting but jack opts for a little bit of a different version and he replaces the globe with the head of a bulldog so now that he's cool enough, he's going out every night, he's drinking with the Marines, he's partying before they get shipped off to war. And this is where things start to go a little sideways. He starts getting into a little bit of trouble. One day, they're at this outdoor bar. He's wearing his garrison cap, also known as a piss cutter. And he's talking to a group of women with his friend group. And then some other group of Marines comes up and the biggest guy there picks on him because he's the shortest. He's 5'8", but he's 180 pounds. That's he's weak. stocky. That's he's a weak. boxer. He's 
not the first, I think he's 15 at this point. He's not the first 15 year old that you'd want to mess with. So this older Marine attempting to punk him, walks up to him, he's grabs a hat out. off the top of his head and turns it sideways and says, hey, you look like Napoleon. At which point Jack immediately knocks this dude out cold. So he gets into a little bit of trouble for that. Then the weekend comes around and one of the Marines has a brilliant idea. Hey, we're in California. We should go to Tijuana. So now the 15 year old Marine is going to party with all the other Marines in, in Tijuana, which once again, I'm just going to have to let you imagine how that goes. Bro, how many girls did he get? I need to know, man. What, what? Before he goes off the war and increases one body count. I want to know what the other one was before he got there. That's crazy. Well, we caught the infamous Vogel. Wait for me to go. Wait for me on the outside. You're going to go to Hawaii. <laughs> and this is pretty much the new norm until November of 1943, when the entire unit gets sent out to Hawaii. And while mm. they're there, there's not much time to goof off. Things are moving quick. His unit finds out that they are going to be invading this island called Tarawa, and apparently it's going to be a big deal. So Jake takes his time to write potentially his final letters home, sends those off, and then helps keep getting ready to go off to war. The day finally comes. They're going to load up on the boats and get ready to take off. Jack is pumped. He's finally getting to go off to war. This is exactly what he's been wanting for years at this point. So they're forming up by the ramp of the boat. They got a guy there with the roster. As soon as he calls your name, you say here, and then you go and you get on the boat, okay? They called Jack Lucas and they say fall out to the Colonel so-and-so's office. Oh, shit. Oh, they okay, found out his point, age. Jack's shitting bricks. He has no idea what's going on. He goes into the Colonel's office. The Colonel sits him down and is like, look, son, you know we screen the mail when you send it out of the base, right? To make sure you're not telling anybody anything they're not supposed to know. And Jack's like, I, I didn't know that. And then it dawns on him. He, he, did he reveal his age in the, my bad. He mentioned in one of his letters that he was 15 years old. Oh, and now the core he's knows the truth. The Colonel informs Jack that he is doing the paperwork to get him separated and chaptered out of the United States Marine. Why would you say that? Even if they didn't screen it, what is the purpose in saying that, bro? What are you doing? Oh, my. I mean, he was 14, I guess, man, you know. Core, at which point Jack tells the colonel, if you do that, I'm just going to go to the army and they're not going to check and they're not going to care. This stops the colonel in his tracks and he stops filling out the paperwork and he's thinking about what to do. And it dawns on him the best thing he can do to help this reckless kid is to keep him here as a Marine where he can keep an eye on him. So that's what mm. the Colonel does. He ends up making Jack the garbage truck driver on the base. That's crazy. So Jack is absolutely furious. All of his buddies are going off to war and now he's a garbage man. So one day Jack's driving the garbage truck. He's got to pull over and get some gas. So he pulls over at this gas station slash automotive repair shop and he's looking around and there's like this little impound lot. And in this little impound lot sitting up on some blocks is this badass 1935 black Auburn convertible. Aspire. And he ends up asking the gas station attendant like, hey, what's up with this cool ass sports car? And the attendant is like, oh, some millionaire abandoned it after they attacked Pearl Harbor. It's just been sitting there. If you want it, we'll sell it to you for like 150 50 bucks. So Jack gets two of his buddies. They pull their money together. They buy this 1935 Auburn convertible problem. It has no rims and no tires. However, mm. he's going to strategically acquire some from the army. Okay. Gets those put on, <laughs> fixes the canvas convertible part with some canvas that he also tactically acquires from the army. So now he's got a car, but here's the problem. He's 15. He doesn't have a driver's license and the car's not registered because it's it's basically stolen. stolen. But here's the upside. This is a really fancy car. And not only is this a really fancy car just by normal car standards, this is a really fancy car and it's in Hawaii in the 1940s. Meaning nobody else has a car like this in Hawaii and whoever paid the money to have this imported to Hawaii spent a ton of money to do it. Mm -hmm. So nobody has the balls to pull this car over because whenever they see some young private driving this thing, they just automatically assume, oh, that's got to be like the personal attendant to some general or something. Mm -hmm. And he's driving the general's car on very official business. I'm not going to fuck with him. So now Jack and his two buddies, a couple of Marines have a car that they're never going to get pulled over in cruising around Hawaii. 
It is at this point that things start to go sideways. Jack is not handling the fact that all of his buddies went off to war without him very well, and every time he gets leave, Liberty, he goes out, he gets drunk, and he ends up getting in a fight. He goes on 17 Liberties, he gets in 17 fights, he gets arrested 17. What does going on Liberties mean? Was that like, is that like when you get to go off the base and chill? times and on the 18th liberty he gets in an 18th fight and this fight is with some six foot three pretty boy marine that they're putting on all the posters and the billboards for recruiting and jack ends up beating the shit out of this dude and messing up his pretty face mm. at which point he gets thrown in the brig and he's awaiting trial by a military court for 45 days they drag him outside and make him break rocks all day long after 45 days of that he finally gets his court date and his official punishment is time served plus 30 days of bread and water. Bread and water is a Navy punishment that's been around pretty much since the inception of the country and they didn't get rid of it that's until how you 2019. What it originally was back in the day was basically solitary confinement, except for your meals, you get two slices of bread and one glass of water. And then in 1909, they decided that 30 days, which was the maximum sentence, was too much and they reduced it down to a maximum of seven days on bread and water that was allowed. Now, this is the 1940s. That's later than 1909. How on earth did Jack just get sentenced to 30 days they of didn't care water. well the workaround if you really upset somebody is they'll still sentence you to 30 days but once a week you'll get one normal meal and like an hour outside of your cell that way it resets the clock on your seven day punishment because you just can't go 30 days unbroken without a normal meal so they give you one meal to reset the clock so that sucks but he gets through it by the time he gets out it's may 1944 meets back up with his buddies they still got the car everything's good okay you just man. got out of jail what's the first thing you do you're a 16 year old marine go drink and get in a fight come on now that's what's gonna happen right obviously we're gonna go steal a bunch of booze and get hammered what a stupid son of a bitch so Jack and his buddies decide they're going to go. They're going to get 15 jerry cans and they're going to sneak into the harbor at night onto a naval vessel and fill them with all the booze from the naval vessels reserves. Okay, it goes great. They get away with it. They get 15 jerry cans full of beer and they bring it back to the company and everybody starts drinking. They have a great time. After a couple of hours, all the booze is gone. Jack and his two buddies, it's okay, we'll go get more. They grab the empty jerry cans. They throw them in the car. They hop in the car. 18 jerry cans? How big is a freaking jerry can that they drank it all in a couple hours? They drive back to the same exact ship. They, they literally return to the scene of the crime and they end up crashing the car along the way. So the other two buddies, they bail out, but Jack was sitting in the middle seat so he didn't have time to jump out. He ends up getting tackled by the MPs mm. and they got him. Jack, being the homie that he is, refuses to rat on anyone, gets 45 days of breaking rocks awaiting his court date, has his court date, gets sentenced, 30 days bread and water again. I could honestly eat it for every meal or just eat it all the time without even stopping. <laughs> bread makes you fat. Bread makes you fat? So he does his time, he gets out, and when he gets out, something's something's different. There's hundreds mm. of ships now, okay? There's a ton of Navy dudes, way more Marines. All the ships are sending Higgin boats ashore to let all their guys go on leave, get supplies, and so on. And he figures there's hundreds of ships out he's there. One of them has one. to have my cousin, Sam Lucas, on it, right? So he decides that he's going to hop in one of these Higgins boats and ride out to one of the ships and start asking around, see if he can maybe figure out where his cousin's at. So that's what he does. He just hops onto one of these Higgins boats, gets ferried out to a naval vessel nobody's really asking questions or verifying anything they're going back and forth all day long it's really not that big of a deal so he gets onto this u.s naval ship it's the uss duel he gets up starts asking around like hey does anybody know my cousin his name's sam lucas and holy shit the very first ship out of a couple hundred is the same exact ship that his cousin's on not mm. only that but his cousin is on board right now and he's in the infirmary because he's getting stitches because somebody smashed him in the face with a beer bottle in a bar fight Apparently it runs in the family. So he goes, he meets up with his cousin. They're having a little reunion. They're hanging out and the time comes. He should probably, you know, hop back on a Higgins boat and make his way back to the base. He's on leave, but obviously he can't sleep on the ship. He doesn't have a bed here. At which point his cousin, Sammy is like, Hey, most of us are just sleeping on the deck of the ship. Anyways, partying. Nobody wants to be like, you know, down in the dungeon where the cots are. It's so nice outside. We're just sleeping out in the open. Mm. You could sleep here too. And he's like, okay, perfect. So he just stays the night there. Then while they're hanging out that night, Sam explains to him that they're gearing up for some big huge island invasion a massive battle that all these ships are going to be going to at which point jack is like 
I'm in. Fuck it, I'm staying here. I'm gonna stow away on the ship. Nobody's gonna notice because there's hundreds of dudes just sleeping on the deck of every ship and I blend right in. I have a Marine uniform. I look like everybody else. Nobody's gonna know that I'm here. <laughs> I'm just gonna stay here and end up going to battle so I can finally fight the Japanese. Yet again, going AWOL so that he can go to war. He just starts living on the ship. And this goes on for 29 days. On day 29, his cousin Sam is like, okay, are you sure that you want to do this, dude? Because on day 30, you legit, it's no longer like you were AWOL, you weren't where you're supposed to be in the military. You become a legitimate fugitive and they're going to send your picture to every sheriff's department in the country. Hearing this, it dawns oh. on Jack like, oh shit, I really don't want my mom and my family and all my friends seeing me on wanted posters being a fugitive from the law. I better go turn myself in. So he goes to the captain of the ship, explains everything that happened, and the captain is like... Bro, this is going to be so much paperwork. Why did you do this on my <laughs> ship? And the real problem is this is like a day or two before all the ships are supposed to leave to head off to Iwo Jima. So when the captain runs it up, his chain of command talks to his boss, some colonel, and is like, hey, I've got this stowaway that wanted to go and fight the Japanese. The That's 15. Where is he 16 yet? Colonel's like, I don't care what you do with them. Just figure out where to put them. At which point, Jack chimes into the conversation. Is like, actually, can I be stationed with the Marines right here on this ship? My cousin's here. It'd be great. At which point, the colonel's like, fucking sure. I don't care. Get out of my office. So at this point, the commander of the <laughs> ship is like, okay, well, I guess you're with me. I'll get the paperwork squared away and we're setting sail tomorrow. So I guess fucking find a bunk. So now that original colonel that was the one that decided that Jack was going to stay in Hawaii so that he could keep an eye on him is kind of put in a very difficult situation because in order to stop this transfer, he has to admit that Jack is underaged and that he knew about it, which is going to get him in trouble. And mm -hmm. that's assuming that he ever even found out about this in the first place before they set sail, which he probably didn't. Regardless, Jack is now headed off to storm the beach at Iwo Jima at the age of 17. Oh, so I mean... <clears throat> Before he got sent off, he was 17. So, I mean, technically, he didn't break no rules, really. All right. He just, you know, he was uh, in the incubator waiting. <laughs> If you don't know, Iwo Jima is one of the bloodiest battles in American history. The island itself is extremely strategically important because A, America needs it to build airfields to be able to bomb mainland Japan, and B, they can't allow Japan to have it because they'll set up radio arrays that are going to be able to give them a two-hour warning whenever America does try to bomb if they don't have this island. This mm. island is only eight square miles, and the Japanese have built underground tunnel networks, pillboxes, and artillery positions all over it. There's over a underground tunnel network networks pill bro you, if you've ever played final fantasy 7 all my gamers out there that one place where the phoenix is at the top i forgot what the city's called it looked just like this that's crazy boxes and artillery positions all over it there's over 20,000 japanese soldiers there that have all been ordered that they are required to kill 10 americans before they die themselves the battle takes place in february of 1945 mm. but the americans have been bombing it and shelling it with naval gunfire since november of 1944 by the time the marines got there to launch their amphibious landing many of them described the island as looking like a burnt pork chop with no signs <laughs> of life anywhere despite that most of the Japanese soldiers survived by hiding in their underground cave networks. So bombing's not going to work. They're going to have to send in the Marines to clear out these caves in close quarters combat. And let me tell you, back in Grandpa's day, they did CQB a little bit different. QB? What's that mean? Quarters. During the attack, forces are pretty much going to be split in half. Half the forces are going to be taking over Mount Saribachi, and the other half are going to make their way north so they can take over the airfield. And Jack is mm. going to be in the second wave landing on Red Beach, meaning that he will be making his way north to attack the airfield. The first wave launches, and it's anticlimactic. There's no gunfire. There's no artillery. It's just the sound of the ocean and the roar of the engine. And some of the Amtraks and Higgins boats start making their way onto the beach and Bro, offloading imagine. their troops. And thousands of Marines get onto the beach and that is when the Japanese attack. The Japanese intentionally let the Marines reach the beach before opening fire. That way they could create a bottleneck similar to a traffic jam. Ended up causing Amtrak's and Higgins boats to crash into one another, sinking mm. the boats in place. And now the second wave isn't able to launch because they're gonna get hung up on all the wreckage of the other Higgins boats and Amtrak's. Every square inch of this beach is covered by overlapping fields of machine gun fire and artillery. And the only place the Marines have to take cover is inside the craters created by the bombings from America 
America in the months prior. Initially, it's chaos, but eventually the Marines were able to get organized enough to start having crews go out and start moving the wreckage of the Higgins boats and the Amtraks, clearing away for the second wave to make a landing. And after the two longest hours in these guys' lives, they finally launched the second wave. Jack is riding in on a Higgins boat. He said the only thing he could hear was the roar of the engine and machine gun fire. Nobody was talking. He was literally sitting shoulder to shoulder with other men and he felt completely I could not alone. imagine it was the loudest silence he'd ever heard in his entire life for whatever reason maybe he got too excited or maybe he was concerned that he was going to crash into the wreckage of another higgins boat the coxswain driving jack's higgins boat drop the door too early all the marines run out and sink into the water up to their chest but jack at 5 8 on the shorter side is sunk into water up to his chin and he has to look up to be able to breathe as he tries to run mm. through the ocean into gunfire he ends up making it to the beach and he's there pinned down for two hours and then he said after two hours he just came to the realization is this the, is this the the battle that you do on call of duty Listen, I'm sounding like an ignorant American right now. I'm sorry. I'm just asking questions, though. But they have like a, a, a mode called war where you like switch sides and you run on the beach, break through the bunker, blah, blah. Listen, all my Call of Duty players, y'all know. Is this what it is? I could have swore it was called something else, though. That if he heard the explosion, it had already missed him. And whatever was going to take him out, he was never going to know about. And other Marines were starting to realize this, too, as they just became immune to the fear of this fight. And they all got up and started advancing forward inch mm. by inch for hours. Jack keeps pushing and he keeps hours. pushing and he finally makes it to the very, very front of the front line. And as soon as he gets there, he is immediately sent back to the very base of the beach to receive a heavy machine gun with another Marine. Jack's pissed. He finally made it to the front line. He was finally going to get to engage the enemy, which has been his dream for like the past four years. But this isn't the time to argue. It's not the time to fight. He just turns back around, runs down the beach to get this gun. It's time to get shit done. Him and the other Marine get down there. They find a heavy machine gun. It's on a two wheel cart with a T handle. So one guy on each side and they're supposed to run it up the beach. The problem is the beach is made out of volcanic ash. Oh, and wow. Jack said every single step forward he took, the ash moved beneath his feet two steps back. He said he felt like he was running up a hill made out of wheat. It takes Jack and this other Marine a Dang. while to get this gun moved up the beach. And once they get it there, they are both absolutely Exhausted. smoked. Mm -hmm. But the sun's already starting to go down. So everybody just kind of takes cover for the night and sets up defenses. It's the longest night of everybody's life. Nobody actually gets any sleep. The temperature drops, they're all wet, they're all cold, they're all shivering. The Japanese are known for launching bonsai attacks. At this point in the war, Japan had abandoned that practice because they didn't have enough men to go one for one with America anymore. But at mm. this point, the Marines don't know that, so they're constantly on edge. Every noise out there could be them lurking up to launch a bonsai attack and try to bayonet them. In addition to that, that also makes them want to stay extremely quiet because they don't want to get mistaken for the Japanese sneaking up on anybody by another Marine in a different foxhole. True. So they're all just sitting there shivering, cold, wet, dead quiet, waiting. Morning finally comes and they start making their way towards the airfield. The closer they get, the more and more enemy resistance they encounter. They start getting in a firefight here, a firefight there. And once they get close to the airfield, they actually end up taking over a Japanese trench that had been abandoned because mm. the Japanese knew they were coming and fled into their cave network. Jack and his fire team absolutely were not about to try to follow them into the cave. So they just held their guns, pointed at the cave entrance and called up a flamethrowing Sherman tank from the back. As the Sherman made its way there, the Japanese inside saw it come and ran out of the, the cave back. at which point jack and his fire team opened fire jack shot one and then he shot another and then his gun jams jack ducks down into the trench to unjam his weapon and at that moment he sees two japanese grenades sitting in the trench between him and the guy in front of him oh. at this point jack has 50 questions and he has to answer all of them in the span of a couple two of seconds <laughs> did the japanese leave those grenades there are the pins still in them did they throw them in and we didn't notice because it's a firefight and there's all kinds of crazy shit going on if they did pull the pins and throw them into the trench how long have they been there those grenades only have a four second fuse do i have time to yell grenade and have everybody get out of this trench if i yell are they going to hear me over the sound of this firefight he doesn't know so he has Yo, listen, for all you people sitting in your nice little comfy house, chilling and relaxing, all right, during these times and now, like, bro, listen, okay, there's some people in this world, you just got to respect the hustle, all right, because me on, bro, listen, I, I, I think like in putting that situation 
everybody thinks, says what they would and wouldn't do. But here we have a guy who just hopped up in there off a of sheer will, said, listen, put me to the test. And these are the type of decisions he got to make. Some people complain about, you know, oh, should I get the bread I usually get? It's going up $1, you know what I'm saying? Or should I get the cheaper bread that I don't really like? Oh, my God, what does America do? That, that's how, listen, that's some people struggle, bro. That's all I'm saying. And other people, for them to be able to make those type of decisions, got to make these type of decisions. Hey, hey, I'm just saying. <laughs> has to assume the worst and that that grenade is going to explode in a second. And with that, he accepts the fact that he is going to die in this trench at mm. 17 years old. And the only question left is, does he want to die by himself or does he want everybody else in the trench to die with him? Because right now he is the only one that knows and he is the only one that can do anything about it. And that's not Crazy. a real question to begin with. So he immediately dives on the first grenade using his chest to drive it into the volcanic ash, reaches over grabs a second grenade and pulls it into his chest as he screams grenade and they blow up. Hundreds of pieces of shrapnel are launched into his body as the force of the explosion flips him like a 180 pound pancake. He lands flat on his back. He feels like he's underwater. He can't move. Everything's numb mm. and tingly. He hears a very loud high pitched ringing with the faint noise of a gunfight that's right next to him unfolding after a few seconds he feels the two marines behind him step over what they presume to be his dead corpse as they continue to advance towards the enemy and suddenly jack is alone unable to move the only thing he can do is focus on spitting out and swallowing the blood currently running down his throat so that he doesn't drown he's not sure how long he was alone but he remembers being alone long enough to start praying to god to not let him bleed out and then more marines hop in the trench a whole fire team and with them is a navy corpsman a medic Doc. Okay. And what this corpsman sees is Life a 180 line? pound marine covered from head to toe in blood. His clothes are completely shredded. His arm is mangled. He has one eye hanging outside of his skull by the Hey, no, the hey. optic nerve and he is holding a grenade in his other hand apparently that one was a dud and jack had no idea that he was still holding on to it the corpsman not knowing the status of this grenade acts fast he grabs a grenade out of jack's hand and throws, throws it, it into the adjacent ditch that he presumes is empty and then two japanese soldiers pop out and attack the corpsman ends up killing both of them and then immediately goes to work on Jack. He does everything he can for him on the spot. He gives him a morphine syrette. He shoves his eye back into his skull. He stops oh. as much bleeding as possible. And then he gets two more Marines to grab a litter and start hauling Jack back to the beachhead where they have an aid station set up. At this point, Jack is still wide awake and still completely unable to move as he watches two Marines carry his 180 pound body through the same exact volcanic ash that he was dragging that heavy machine gun nope. up the day prior. Both these guys are completely smoked, but they're doing everything they can to help Jack out. And then eventually one of them trips and drops the litter. Jack falls off, smokes his head on a rock. But at this point, what's one more injury? He makes it to the aid station, gets intubated while he's awake, which is not a pleasant experience. And then he finally gets knocked out. Next thing he knows, he wakes up on a hospital ship. He's so doped up on drugs. Time is completely relative. He can't tell the difference between days and hours but he does remember the doctor coming in and explaining to him that the only reason that he's here is because the volcanic ash mixing with his blood acted like a super coagulant wow. and prevented him from bleeding out. Then next thing he knows, they're getting him ready for another surgery. He doesn't know how many surgeries he's already had. He just knows that the doctor told him this time that the infection is spreading and they might have to amputate his arm. So Jack begs the doctor to try to save his arm and do everything he can and the doctor reluctantly agrees jack wakes up from the surgery his arms in a cast and the doctor comes in and is like okay here's the deal as the last hail mary to try to save your arm we've taken some maggots and put the maggots in True. your infected wounds and the maggots are ideally going to eat away all the infection and be able to save your arm take my arm yep i learned about that next thing he knows he's on his way to guam once he gets to guam he's in this hospital bay with like five other marines and then they go to take his cast off for the first time since he had it put on and when they take it off it's it smells so bad. Full of gray and yellow pus, and he said it was the most horrendous thing he has ever smelled in his entire life. All the other wounded Marines in this bay got up and left, and one of them literally had to crawl on the ground because he was so messed up, and he did it just to get away, get away from, from the, the smell. smell. And crazy. Jack said it was so bad that he didn't blame any of them at all. On God, one of the people in that that um like room 
They went on to make Febreze. Now, that's a completely made-up story. I don't know. But me personally, listen, I would have had the incentive to create Febreze after smelling that. That's it. He then ends up getting sent back to California where he undergoes over 20 surgeries. Over the course of these surgeries, they remove over 250 pieces of shrapnel from his body, ranging in size from a BB to a 22 caliber bullet. And that's just the shrapnel that they were able to get out. He will live the rest of his life with eight pieces of shrapnel permanently lodged in his brain, six in his right lung, and over a hundred pieces throughout the rest of his body. In addition to that, he now also has what he describes as tattooing all over his chest and arms because the volcanic ash was mm. rocketed into his flesh and his wounds and is now healed into his skin. From there, he gets sent closer to home to a hospital in Charleston, South Carolina, where he undergoes a ton of PT and he ends up getting medically discharged from the Marine Corps in September of 1945. And with that, he goes back home to Plymouth, North Carolina to live with mom. And he's there for a couple of weeks and he gets a phone call that he needs to report to Washington, D.C. on October 5th. 1945. Mm. So he shows up to DC. He is informed that they're having a huge ceremony where President Truman is going to give him and 14 other people the Medal of Honor. So he's waiting in line with all the other Medal of Honor recipients during this big ceremony. It's his turn. He goes up. President Truman puts the Medal of Honor around his neck, goes to shake his hand. When he goes to shake his hand, he grabs his hand and then he grabs his shoulder and it's the shoulder of his bad arm. And President Truman doesn't know this, but he is firmly grabbing his shoulder and digging his thumb directly into one of the still very fresh, very open Ooh. wounds inside of his arm. And Jack is doing everything he can to keep his face straight for the camera. But inside, he's, he's just screaming. dying. Just... <sighs> At this point, President Truman, with his thumb still inside Jack's wound, goes, Son, I would rather have this medal than be the President of the United States. At which I want you to get your hands off me, boy. All right? Jack is how about that it's like oh, <laughs> I'll trade you with that Truman kind of chuckles and sends him on his way and now Jack is basically a celebrity he is the youngest mm. person of World War II to earn the Medal of Honor he is the youngest Marine of all time to earn the Medal of Honor and everybody knows his name he's in all the newspapers he's going to all these parties all these events he's going on war bond drives he is having the time of his life. He's also doing a bunch of interviews, and one of the interviews he does is a national radio broadcast, and in this interview, he ends up requesting that people from all over America send his mother newspaper clippings of stories about him, and then mm. he gives out his mother's address on national radio, not realizing what he's done. His poor mother receives over 50 thousand pieces of mail and it completely overloads the tiny Plymouth, North Carolina post office. After a couple oh. months, things die down and he finally gets to go back home and he's in this really weird position because on one hand, he's a 17 year old that's got an eighth grade education and his whole life ahead of him. But on the other hand, he's a combat veteran with the Medal of Honor and a full pension and disability. So he does what any military member does the second they get back from a deployment and have a ton of cash. Go to he drink. buys a brand new Chevy. That didn't mm. take very long. Now he still has to figure out what to do. And he's like, I mean, I guess I did promise my mom I'd go back to school when I got back. So he enrolls in high school. Okay, just so we're all on the same page, Jack is rolling up to his first day of his freshman year of high school in a brand new Chevy with three years in the Marine Corps under as a 17 year old under his belt a six month prison sentence under his belt the medal of honor both conventional and unconventional tattoos okay guess who he's taking to prom probably whoever he wants but i guess that's also <laughs> assuming that he wants to go to prom because it probably doesn't sound very fun after you've been partying in tijuana with the marines true okay, right out of the gate he realizes something is horribly wrong first day of school very first class everybody sits down gets quiet the teacher's talking he's looking around like okay nobody else knows Nobody else is hearing this. It's clearly just me because all Jack hears is yeah, you gotta remember, he was in a firefight with an M1 Grand shooting 30-06 rounds with no hearing protection, okay? This 17-year-old doesn't have 10-itis, he's got 11-itis. So he immediately takes some time off school, goes out, goes to the VA, gets fitted for hearing aids. I can only imagine the VA was still skeptical, you know, like... Are you sure this was service related? After he gets a hearing aid, he does great in high school, goes on, graduates. Then he decides he's going to go to college. Again, I would pay money to read this guy's college application or to be a fly on the wall when they were reviewing the college applications. He goes on, graduates college with a business degree. Then he goes to work for the VA. 1954, he ends up getting married. His new bride has two sons from a previous marriage that he treats as his own. And then she mm. gives him another son. From that point on, he's just kind of living life, you know, nine to five job, white picket fence, 
couple of kids, a wife, you know, the whole shtick. And then one day he wakes up and he's 40 years old and he's like, this shit's boring. I want to, I want to do something cool. I should like, I don't know, conquer the rest of my fears. Um, I literally only have one fear left and that's heights for some reason. So how can I conquer my fear of heights? That seems like something exciting to do. I know I'm going to re-enlist in the United States. All right now, brother, relax, relax. States military, except this time I'm going to join the a army paratrooper. to join the 82nd Airborne Division and become a paratrooper so I can conquer my fear of heights. And that's exactly what he does. He somehow manages to get into the 82nd Airborne and become a paratrooper. So he joins in 1961, does great, starts doing training jumps. He's kind of like conquering his fear of heights, you know? It's pretty cool. You just jump out of the plane. There's a rope attached to your parachute. As soon as you get so far away from the plane, it automatically pulls the parachute for you. There's a jerk. You fall to the ground that kind of hurts for a second but ultimately you're fine okay then one day he's doing another training jump he's the last man to jump out of the plane this time no big deal he's done this like 20 other times it's just another day it's another jump from 1200 feet right so he goes all the other guys jump out in front of him he's the last man out of the plane he jumps out and then he waits and he waits there's no jerk he looks up his parachutes all tangled up Bruh, bruh. Listen, God saved you once, okay? My man said, you know what, God? I think it was a fluke. Let me see if you could do it again. It's not catching any wind. He tries to open it up. He tries everything they taught him how to do. Nothing works. So he gets rid of it, pulls his reserve chute. The same exact thing happens. Fuck. Okay, he's panicking. He's flying past other people that have their parachutes open on his way down to the ground. It's just going to be a matter of seconds. And he's like, I mean, I'm probably done, but the best chance I have at maybe surviving this is landing feet first and doing the little combat roll like you're supposed to do when you have the parachute attached. So fuck it. I guess I'll try it. And that's what he does. He collides with the ground feet first, does his little roll thing, and then stands back up completely fine. Okay. No, 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 no. Listen, we got to check the man DNA. Clearly, my man got the uh, the Captain America super serum or something, okay? Might be Bucky Barnes. I don't know. Winter Soldier program. Something. This is this is nuts. Y'all ever played The Legend of Zelda? Jumped off, and as soon as you hit the ground, you roll. No damage. Heart still intact. That's what he did in real life. This is nuts. Oh my and this goodness. man's got plot armor and a plot parachute, okay? I don't know what he had planned for the rest of the evening, but I'm willing to bet it was to find John Connor. And just to be clear, when I say he was unscathed, he was completely unscathed. He did another training jump two weeks later. He's he said wild. that first jump after the accident, he didn't hesitate at all. He jumped right out. He wasn't scared one bit, which sounds counterintuitive. You would think if anything would make your fear of heights a little bit worse, it would be jumping out of a plane with no parachute. But then you think about it and you're like, well, yeah, no shit. You weren't scared. What's the worst that happens? Your parachute doesn't open and then you're the main character and you're completely fucking fine. Why would you possibly be scared of heights anymore? He goes on to complete 45 jumps between 1961 and 1965. He got out in 1965 when he found out that the United States Army was not going to allow him to deploy to Vietnam because he was a Medal of Honor recipient. So he's like, well, this is lame. I've conquered my fear of heights. Deuces. I'm out. A series of unfortunate. I've no, 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 no. Listen, listen. We done heard too many stories on this channel. Everybody completes all their army sh stuff. Oh, buddy who had the airplane with all the Japanese flags on it because my uh what was it called what is it called when you're like the the wing person dang i forgot what the name was anyway uh listen i'll need to hear another one of them stories. military he opens up a butcher shop remember he's a business major that's what he went to college for so he runs it really really well and over the course of the next decade he grows that business he opens up multiple butcher shops multiple storefronts he ends up owning a ranch where they actually raise the cattle that he slaughters in his butcher shops and sells at his stores during the mm. same period of time that he's growing the business he unfortunately ends up getting a divorce from his first wife and then he ends up getting another wife by the name of Earlene. they end up having two more kids 
and she brings several kids from a previous marriage as well. I'm just gonna level with you. Jack is doing pretty well financially at this point in his life, okay? He's rich, rich. He's like living in a 15 bedroom mansion with multiple sports cars and a pet chimpanzee that wears a dress, rich. No, I'm not exaggerating. That's all true. Then one day he gets a call from the IRS and is like, hey, why haven't taxes. you paid taxes in like two years? And he's like, what are you talking about? So then he calls up the accountant and the accountant looks into it and his wife, who does the bookkeeping, has apparently elected to just not Poor pay the taxes. taxes. Not only has she not been paying the taxes, she's also been taking money out of the business that Jack didn't know about. Oh, she gonna have to see me in the ring, dude. Hey, listen, suit up. We're about to have a uh, wrestling match for the WWE World Federation Championship Cosex. All right, that's what we're doing. Stealing my money. What? No don't like that so jack is understandably pretty upset he's trying to run a business and his wife is embezzling so he cuts her off from the money works really hard to get everything settled and squared up with the irs so he doesn't get his ass sent to prison and then one day he gets a call he while he's sitting down to alimony. dinner and he answers it and they're like is this jack lucas and he's like yeah and he goes this is so and so from the maryland state police we need you to come by the station we've had a report about some some of the product from one of your stores and he's like shit somebody got food poisoning or he's gonna get in trouble they're gonna shut down his shops like everything is just going to hell in a handbasket this is gonna ruin his entire life so he's like okay he goes out goes to meet up with the maryland state police so he shows up to the police department the state police are like okay here's the deal nothing's wrong with your store or your product or anything that was all a cover-up we just needed to get you here to talk to you and we couldn't let anybody else know why you were coming at first, Jack is relieved, and then the cops tell him, the real reason we called you here is because we've been informed that your wife is going to try to murder you. Er I'm taking care of your f f funky little kids, all right? You brought several kids. I took care of them. I got you living lavish. You embezzling money. We driving nice cars. And you want to kill me? Erlene, Jack's wife, apparently approached one of the butcher shop employees and asked for his help to kill Jack. Right. He apparently went along with it and then immediately went to the police. And now the police are setting up a sting operation to catch his wife. And now the Maryland State Police need to get... Bro, if y'all never seen House of Gucci, bro, she did the same thing. She was like, hey, we need this money. Let's sell the company so you could, I could get the money from you. And then she ended up. I don't want to spoil the movie. Y'all watch the movie, man. Jack on board with this sting operation because they're planning to murder him tomorrow. So the current murder plot is that the butcher shop employee and a guy named Jerry, who is Jack's stepdaughter's husband, are going to sedate him at one of the butcher shops after work. Then while he's unconscious, they're going to load him into his car, Ungrateful. drive him out to his cattle ranch where he has a little cabin, and then they're going to meet up with Erlene. She's going to have the getaway vehicle and the gun. Now, in addition to that, the cops wanted to make sure they had some Somebody with a gun in the room at all times in case things went sideways so they had the butcher shop employee go to Erlene and Jerry and was like hey I actually know a hitman and they're like oh my god see if he'll help us and he's like good news my hitman buddy said that he would help us that's the undercover cop so now there's an undercover cop that they think is a hitman that's just like consulting for them that's helping them with this operation as well mm. so the next day rolls around sure enough jerry calls up jack and is like hey me and some of the butcher shop guys and another one of my buddies are all gonna have some beers after work you should come by to which jack is like absolutely i'll be there jack shows up jerry conveniently already has a beer open for him hands it to him jack pretends to take a drink out of it because he knows that there's sedatives in that beer and then he's like i gotta go take a piss he goes over to the bathroom dumps a sedative beer in the sink, throws away the bottle. He's already stashed another beer bottle in that bathroom. He pulls that out, opens it, goes out, sits at the table, starts drinking with the rest of the guys. As he starts drinking more and more, he kind of starts that to act, a you know, more and more sedated. He starts kind of like, you know, nodding his head and pretending like he's fall falling asleep. He's really selling it, okay? He should have been an actor. And he ends up just, <laughs> you know, passing out altogether. And he lets these three dudes load him up in his own car. Whoa, ho, ho, ho. Letting three dudes load you up in your own car. Hey, yo, Paul. So they're all headed out to the ranch to kill him. The hitman, the undercover cop, decides that he's going to light up a cigarette and have a smoke during the drive. At which point, Jerry is like, hey, put out the cigarette. 
Jack doesn't like people smoking in his fancy car. At which point Jack is pretending to be unconscious, but he's actually fighting for his life to not laugh because like, motherfucker, you're murdering me exactly. right now. And you're worried about somebody <laughs> smoking in my car. Like, I don't know. It was just funny to him. So like his belly kind of starts to jiggle a little from laughing and the undercover cop like smacks his belly secretly to get him to stop. But then he like, you know, oh, this guy's not going to care for long. Ha ha ha. But really he was just smacking him to get him to quit laughing. I mean, let's face it. At this point, Jack's got plot armor. He knows he's going to be fine. Who cares? Yep. So they get to the ranch. They get Jack unloaded and into the cabin, at which point Erlene's not there with the gun and everybody's kind of like well what the fuck and jerry's like oh i actually talked with her she's down the street at the gas station we're gonna go get her okay me and uh hitman undercover cop guy are gonna hop in the car we're gonna go pick her up butcher shop employee you stay here make sure he stays unconscious okay good they go to get Erlene. They swing by the gas station. Erlene follows them in her car back to the ranch, at mm. which point they arrive and cops are already there ready to stop the whole scenario. The undercover cop in the car with Jerry pulls his gun out, points it at him, says something cool like, ha, gotcha, you, you son of a bitch. And then the whole <laughs> crime is over. Erlene had brought a gun and that was enough evidence to be able to convict her to guarantee that she was actually going to go through with this murder. Mm. And here's the kicker. Jack owned a lot of guns. He had a lot of money. He was a veteran. He liked guns. Of all the guns he had, she she bought the one that he his mom's old gun watch. Elected to grab his 38 caliber pistol, his mother's 38 caliber pistol, the same one that he had in the Marine Corps, twirling around his finger in the tent that he had accidentally shot off. His most sentimental weapon, and she was gonna shoot him in the head with it. Yo, listen, women deserve nothing okay nothing this is crazy oh, i'm sorry all the good women out there you know what i'm saying clap it up for yourselves all three of y'all you know what i'm saying you deserve it the rest of your counterpart get them out of here bro like what what is this and despite that, Jack goes to court and testifies on her behalf because he doesn't want the mother of his kids. Boy, boy, hey, Jack, Jack, you done did a lot of great things in your life. This is not one of them, all right? Put her under the jail, you know what I'm saying? Some extra, matter of fact, break some stones because you good at that and throw them on top of her, boy, you're done. Ain't no way he testified for her. She tried to kill you, bruh. in prison for 20 years, which is what she was facing, and she gets pleaded down to 10 years of probation. Obviously, they still separate, they get a divorce, he ends up moving back to North Carolina, buys a plot of land, sets up a detachable garage, buys a mobile home, and he's just kind of living there. Then him and Erlene's oldest son, Kelly, comes to live with him, and that, that's what he's got going on. He kind of then him and Erlene's oldest son, Kelly, comes to live with him. And that, that's what he's got going on. He kind of let everything else in his life go. He's living in this mobile home and everything just kind of is what it is. Then before Jack can even get the city to run a water line out to his new mobile home, the neighbor ends up lighting his mobile home on fire with him in it because he didn't want neighbors. So he wakes up in the middle of the night to the smell of smoke. Him and Kelly get out of the mobile home. The entire thing burns completely to the ground. He loses everything, all of his guns, all of his pictures, letters, all of his stuff from his time in the service. And the next morning, the only thing he's able to pull from the ashes of his mobile home is the actual star itself from the Medal of Honor. This ends up making it into the papers, you know, war hero, almost assassinated by his wife, has his house burnt down. Now he basically has nothing. At this point, one of his buddies from Maryland hits him up and is like, hey, I got this new property. I'm building a farmhouse out in the country. Why don't you just, you know, come help me with it if you don't got anything else going on. So he's like, okay, fuck it. Sure. I mean, I don't have anything else to do. So he goes back to Maryland and he's basically camping at night and then working on this farmhouse during the day, him and his son, Kelly. They're there for two weeks and then the cops show up and arrest him because this property has a bunch of marijuana growing on it and they think that he's a marijuana farmer. Again, this makes it into the papers. War hero, Medal of Honor recipient, caught growing marijuana and his name's plastered all over the papers and then it finally ends up getting dismissed in court because they realize, oh, he's only been here for two weeks and these are fully matured marijuana plants. There's no way he was doing this in intentionally or doing it at all so he ends up getting let go and the whole thing kind of goes away but he's like the dude just can't catch a break so he ends up moving back to north carolina to his property where his burnt down mobile home was and now he's living inside of the detached garage
much. And to make things worse, the IRS starts garnishing all the money he gets from being a Medal of Honor recipient and his disability checks because apparently the situation with Erlene was worse than he had originally thought and he apparently still owes the IRS money. So they're taking all of his government benefits as well. Once again, you're taking government benefits that I earned to give it back to the... Boy, there's no way. No way. All right? The newspapers hear about this, they run with the story, a veterans organization finds out, and they put a ton of pressure on the IRS to fucking knock it off. The dude's a Medal of Honor recipient. Bro, you want to know why y'all are able to sit in your little office and look up on it? Listen, IRS, I don't want no smoke. I'm just, I'm just, this is, uh, this is, um, yeah. Uh, who didn't pay their taxes? Let's go get them. <laughs> Ah, we're taking their money. You want to know why we're able to do that? All right. Because my mans was out there jumping on grenades. Y'all need to relax. Relax. All right. Some people, they earned the pass. All right. Recipient. He shouldn't have to pay taxes, period. Let alone mm. have his fucking benefits garnished because you think he owes you money. Bro, I feel like veterans should get the same privileges churches get, bro. They, they say churches don't got to pay taxes. I feel like because what they do, you know what I'm saying? If you give your life potentially to the country, maybe, maybe that's enough, right? You don't need no money. My life was on the line, especially like if you get to a certain level, maybe not everybody, but my man got a Medal of Honor, okay? Medal of Honor recipients, your life was on the line, all right? You gave your life, you don't got to, you don't got to, your your representation is done. You don't need to be taxed no more. Listen, you get you, you get the vote, you know what I'm saying? All of that stuff. Your debt has been paid for life. Okay? Hey, I don't know, man. This is crazy. The IRS takes so much backlash, they end up giving him his benefits back, and the federal government steps in and ends up making it a law that veterans' benefits are immune to creditors and they cannot be garnished by the IRS whatsoever. Yeah, how how I'm getting paid from the government and y'all coming to take it back. After that fiasco, he ends up getting in touch with one of his old friends from the military and he decides that he's going to go out and visit him in Hattiesburg, Mississippi. And while he's there, he absolutely falls in love with the town and he decides that he's going to move there. He buys a house. He meets a lovely lady by the name of Ruby. He describes her as pretty, smart, and possessing the virtue of unlimited patience. He mm. asks her to marry him. She agrees. And Jack Lucas finally got to live happily ever after. And that w is Mains. the story of the United States Marine Corps' youngest Medal of Honor recipient, America's indestructible Marine, Jack Lucas. Thank you for watching. Best way to support the channel is go buy some merch over at thefatelectrician.com. Quack bang out. I do not know why God spared my life so many times. I've been mm. searching for an answer to that question since that faithful day in February 1945. I feel that he has entrusted me with the responsibility of passing on to other Americans my first-hand knowledge of the enormous price that has been paid for their freedom. Those who have died on the field of battle cannot speak for themselves. That duty is mine. I will carry their banner forward and continue to plant the seeds so that others may continue the work after I am gone. The honor is humbling. Is there another one? Walked up there and saluted. And the president said, I'd rather have this medal than be president of the United States. And I said, Sir, I'll swap it. <laughs> and he, he just laughed. I don't feel like I'm some. Oh, ace, ace of aces, bro. That's, that's what I was talking about. Big hero or anything like that. This video right here. The real heroes are the ones who had to give their all, their life. And they are the truest heroes in my book. W Mains. Hey, bro, look, look, listen, listen. I think he did a lot of great things. Two fatal mistakes. Okay. Number one, you jump back out of a plane. Okay. When God was like, okay, look, listen, I know you wanted to test me. You wanted to see if I could do it again. I showed you. Don't put it to the test no more. Okay. And then for a third time, he put it to a test. He said, you know what? She wanted to kill me, take everything I got. Don't put her in jail, let her back out. Listen, he's a better man than me. Because if I was plotting to let her out, it's be because she's not going to jail, okay? 
she's going to the afterlife. <laughs> <laughs> hey, listen, y'all like, comment, subscribe, all that great stuff. And, uh, yo, this was a banger. I ain't going to lie. I'm going to see y'all next time. Peace.